I'm going to talk now uh, quickly about technology. We've got a couple of, uh, we've got three speakers who are going to talk in more depth about some of these things. But I thought I'd just give you a quick overview of it. The three technologies that we're, um, that we're, I suppose we see as being most relevant in this sort of rural space, uh, and the ones we've used are wireless, uh, fibre to the home, and fibre to the cabinet, which is something that we've not used yet, but we may use in the future. Starting with wireless, uh, to the left there you can see a picture of our new mass that we put up to bring the internet connection into Alston uh, last year. This is, uh, we, we used wireless, we started using it at the beginning, partly because uh, the BT service wasn't available and it would actually deliver a service over longer distances and we had a measure of control over that connection. So we'd put the wireless equipment in, uh, we'd be able to look after it and if it broke then we'd go out and replace it. So as an organisation, I've been used it for 10 years, we still have quite a strong affinity to that technology because it's yeah, it served us well and it's been really good for rural areas where you go in and people don't have, feel they don't have any, have any choice. Uh, the picture there of the guy from Lucid uh, doing a bit of fibre splicing. Uh, that's a fibre to the home installation. That's in. It's actually my my house. <laughs> um, that is something which we see as being uh, the real twenty sort of first century digital infrastructure. Uh, it's more or less future proof. You know, it, when when we've actually put it in there, it'll work for the next 30 years or so. And so we see that as being really crucial in terms of going forward with Cybermore because it moves us into being more of a sort of utility <laughs> provider. Uh, same way as you know, your gas provider, electricity provider. It doesn't really go wrong and it gives you the ability to offer people a much more stable, stable connection. And for investors that want to put money into it, Cybermore networks, it's a much more stable financial investment too. With fibre to the cabinet, you a picture there of a green cabinet, that's where you basically take a BT service coming in, uh, coming into a village and then you break into the BT network there, the green cabinet, and then you provide much higher internet speeds using that. And it's been used quite successfully by some rural communities, uh, particularly down in Rutland. Uh, as Kevin mentioned earlier, looking over towards Rookup, uh, Digital Durham, the organisation within Durham County Council, they're, they're really keen to try out that, some, of that, um, some of that equipment over there. So we may well be getting involved with that as well. I suppose the, when you come to choose your technology, the four key influences are things on the slide there. Funding is the big one. And it's where many of these projects have to start because you, know, you may say, well, we want, we want to put fibre into all the homes in the village, which is great because it's a long-term solution and it uh, you know, provides the faster speeds and all, all that stuff. But in fact, it, it requires so much investment that you just can't get the money from it anywhere, for it anywhere. The other thing to think of about is, is running costs because... Uh, what we found is some of the technology which appears cheap to buy at the outset actually costs a lot more to run as, a, as you go on, so you've got a much higher revenue cost. Uh, and again, it's trying to find that balance. Do you splash out a bit more at the beginning on better equipment, or do you go out and connect more people with, uh, with lower cost equipment, but which is going to need more uh, babysitting in the future? What we don't often talk about with technology is the environment and how you know how the technology we're going to put in can affect that. I know you know things like uh, I always remember right at the very beginning of Cybermore, uh, there was a big tree down by the river in Alston and it was cut down, and uh, it was raised at the parish council meeting that it had been cut down because Cybermore had uh, damaged some of the tree roots, laying cables. Even though at that stage we'd not laid any cables, this was back in 2002. So we caught the blame for this tree being shot down, which is a really nice tree. Um, 
more, I suppose, more relevant though is things like the, uh, the using wireless equipment and actually putting that equipment into conservation areas like the centre of Austin, and then that can uh, then that can make some, you know wind people up. Also, you've got um, areas where you actually where you are actually digging or putting cables down or putting cables across buildings. This is one of the things that you can think you think of. Uh, it's not an issue, but believe me, a lot of people out there do feel strongly about it, and it's something that you have to handle very sensitively. Final one up there is community feeling, and this is one of these soft, amorphous things that you can never quite get a handle on. But basically, if you've got a community that is there and willing to put money into something like a fibre optic solution because they feel that this is right for their right for their community, they want to put the money into it, uh, then that that will go a lot a lot further than a community where people aren't that interested. You know, they maybe get an okay connection at the moment, but they don't really want to step out and do any more uh, than the absolute minimum to make some, to make any improvements to it. And those three, th those those four elements all sort of work in tandem uh, as you come to make a decision. You have to take them all into account, and there's no sort of route map to say this is the absolute best best solution. But you have to take all those things into consideration. In terms of what we've got here at Cybermore, we've got a microwave link which brings the internet in from Northumberland. We've got um, proxim equipment which is used to deliver broadband around the community. And we've still got some of the Cisco equipment working which was put in uh, eight, nine years ago. Uh, and that's still servicing some customers as well. So it is a bit of a, a, bit of a mixture at the moment. Uh, in terms of fibre, MTEL who um, we're going to be hearing from in a minute. They actually provided us with the ducting to put that in, and we have Allied Telesis end user equipment and Lucid Optical Solutions, who we'll be hearing from as well. They've, uh, they're, going to, they're going to explain a bit about what they do in terms of splicing those things together. And I think one of the key ingredients for our success has been the really good relationships that we have with those suppliers. Uh, Dominic, who's going to talk to you from 802 Global and supply the wireless stuff, he's, he's been really great in terms of acting as a sounding board when we've been looking to do new things, explaining what technology is going to work, helping out with site surveys. Um, Dave from Antel, they've been hugely helpful in terms of actually getting the fibre put through the ducts, working through some of the challenges that we've had in the sort of terrain you've got around here, which isn't not, you know, you hear about a lot of these fibre schemes done in the Netherlands, places like that, where it is relatively straightforward. Here, it, every every bit of it is a battle. You know, it's it's always complex. You have to be really innovative to find solutions to it. And uh, Annette's going to talk to us from Lucid Optical Solutions as well about how you actually do that last bit, which is fusing together all the bits of fibre. <laughs> 